Thank you. This is going to be a lower key easier today. We're not going to cram science at you all day today. This is going to be easy. Um, when I put up the first slides, and I won't even need these, these slides today because it's going to be talk, it's not going to be diagrams, and, and that kind of pictures aren't that necessary, and, and uh, we won't need, won't need the slides. But if you recall on the very first slide, I, I said that we talk about science yesterday, and today it was going to be, why should I care? You know, what does this have to do with me? Because there really are two very different aspects to MBT. One of them we talked about yesterday, and that's the science part of MBT, which, of course, I'm a scientist, you know, I like that, and I, I think that's important because I think it's the lever to make the rest of MBT become more known, more used, to become more helpful. So the science is important, but where the real message is, the message that's really much more important than the science message, if you just look at the, at the content of the message, it's in that soft side of MBT, not in the science side. So when I wrote those books, I really didn't write them to be science books. And when you read them, they're not. They're about consciousness. They're about growing up. They're about personal evolution. And that's more fundamental to MBT than is the science. Science has its own importance, but it's not really the thing that is most significant. The thing that's most significant is what can it do to help you? you know, it's your own personal connection to this information that is the key to getting something useful out of MBT. Most of the science is all up here. It's all intellectual. But that's not where the important things take place. The important things take place at your core, what I call the being level. That's where everything significant goes on, is at that level, not up here. Matter of fact, this level up here in the head tends to confuse, obfuscate, and make this level down here hard to get in touch with because we in our culture tend to live out of our heads. That's kind of home for us and we, we make all of our decisions, all of our choices, all of the, our relationships, everything we're doing, we're running out of our head. We're trying to figure everything out. And often the reason we're trying to figure everything out is because we want to optimize our experience. We want to optimize our world. And if we're full of fear and ego, optimize our world means make it the way we want it, right? Make it so it suits our ego and suits our fears. Of course, that's really not where we want to go. So we're going to talk today about the soft side of MBT, and we're going to have a lot of q and A. I'm just going to talk for a short time. Because really what's important are your questions. And I find answering your questions to be more significant than standing up here and lecturing to you. You can go to YouTube and hear everything that I'm going to talk about, you know, from 10 different lectures. You can read the books, and it's all in there. So me standing up and talking to you, eh, you know, it's got some value, but it's not really that important. Your questions are much more important. Besides that, your questions are new and fresh. And instead of me just talking about things I've talked about many times, it's better to talk about what's on your mind because this is going to go out to many, many thousands of people, tens of thousands. Most of my stuff that's been out for a few years is near the hundreds of thousands of people. So when that happens, You'd be surprised how many people have similar questions. So when I answer your question, there'll be 15,000 people that that'll help because they have the same issues, the same thoughts, the same questions. We all come mostly from around the same cultures. We kind of had grown up in the same 
worldviews. And then we will mostly have some, you know, the same questions. It's coming out of the same roots. So your questions are very valuable, more valuable than my lecturing to you. So that's what we'll do most of the time. So you can be thinking about what are your questions? What is it that, you know, you really would like to know? And, and uh, the stuff that's kind of got you stuck and you're not sure how to deal with that or what you should do with this. But anyway, on to, the, on to the soft side. What does MBT have to do with you? you know, why should you really care about this? Well, there's, there's really a whole bunch of reasons for that. One is, it will help you find direction. Okay. What are you supposed to be doing? What's the point of your existence? Why get up in the morning? You know, that sort of thing. And the answer to that, of course, is that you're on a mission. Your mission is to grow up. It's to lower your entropy. It's to become love. That's your mission. That's what you're here for. And in as much as you ignore that, then your life becomes difficult and it becomes a struggle. And it's got a whole lot more unhappiness in it than happiness, a lot of pain. And as much as you realize that's your mission and you work on it, life begins to get interesting and exciting and stuff starts to happen and you have a lot more happiness and joy than you have, you know, misery and pain. So that sounds like, you know, the carrot and the stick, right? The, uh, the carrot says, you know, work on these things and life will be good, or life will get better, ignore these things and, you know, it will get worse. So that's kind of an important thing to know. So why, why are you here? And how does this reality work? How do you interact with it? How do you grow up? What's the, what's the strategy? What's the, you know, what's the uh, prescription? Everybody would like to have a prescription. You know, in a few words, I could just tell you, oh, just be. Just go and be. Live out of your being level and try to find a lesson in everything. That's it. We're done. You know, that's, that's the whole prescription. But, of course, that doesn't help too many people because that's too up in the air and too abstract and it's not too personal. And people will nod their head to that, but they really don't know how to you know, action on it, what to do with it. So we'll get a little more specific here about the things that you can do and how to approach it and uh, really what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. You should understand that you and everybody else, all the other consciousnesses on this planet, create, in many ways, the reality that we have here. The reality we live in, and that's kind of a sad thought, isn't it? The reality that we live in, with all of its meanness, with all of its greed, with all of its you know, um, arrogance, with all of its abusiveness, that's what we created. That's our reality. That's a good reflection of who we are as humanity. If you look around the world and see, you know, what's going on, what's the quality of life out there, that's what we've created. That's ours. That represents us on an average. Yeah, like I say, not a happy thought, but that's, that's just the way it is. Well, if we create it, we can make it better. That's a, you know, that's a good, that is a happy thought. We can make it better. Now, how do we make it better? Well, most of us would like to go out and change those things that we know are bad. Oh, well, this person is a real arrogant person. You know, we, he shouldn't be in any power, you know, and this person shouldn't be the head of that corporation because they just rip people off. And, you know, we could just change the pieces around on the board. Everything would get a lot better. You know, we could, if we had that sort of power that we could go out and manipulate the world to make it a kinder, gentler place. But unfortunately, that wouldn't help. In the long run, it would go right back to the way it was because we'd still all be right the way we were and we'd create this reality and we'd put it right back just the way it was. No matter who you put at the top, if you found the 
kindest, lovingest, you know, most generous people who had big ideas and you made them in charge of everything, eventually it'd just go back the way it was. That doesn't cause any permanent change. So that's not the answer. It's not out going out there and manipulating the world to make it better, changing things. What that's doing is working on the symptoms. The symptoms are that people are mean-spirited. They don't cooperate. They don't care about others. They care about themselves. You see, that's, we, we see that, and we see all the symptoms of that, but we don't see the, you know, we don't really pay attention to the root cause of that. And the root cause of that is inside each and every one of us. It's, it's who we are. So changing the world, saving the world even if you like, isn't a matter of manipulating it and making it more the way we know that it would be better. It doesn't work. The only thing that we can really change that makes a difference, a real difference, is ourselves. That's it. You can't change anybody else. You can only change yourself. But don't underestimate that. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of power. If you change yourself, if you grow up, if you get rid of your fear, that will change all the people you interact with. That will make a difference. We're passing information back and forth between us all the time. We're all netted. We're all in this, this consciousness net. All consciousness is netted together. And when you are fearless, when you don't have the ego and the fear driving you, that rubs off on other people. It makes them, when they're around you, it pulls them up a little bit. Just like if you're around people who are just miserable and negative and so on, it kind of drags you down a little bit. It works both ways. So if there's enough of us pulling up instead of dragging down, then we'll have a, a major change. So the first thing, of course, is to realize that your, your, your reason to be here is to grow up. Okay, that gives you incentive. The second is to see that you're responsible for you and you don't need to change your neighbor. You don't need to change the other people and make them act better. You just need to change yourself. And when you change yourself, it only is going to improve you if you change yourself at the being level. This is not about learning things at the intellectual level. Okay. You can read all the books and, you know, get all the information and not really learn a thing. It's the difference between, what do they say, uh, you know, t what is it, uh, talk the talk or walk the talk, you know. You can talk about it. You can intellectually interact with it. You can say all the right things and you can sound very learned and grown up, but that doesn't make you learned and grown up. That's acting, not being. And what we're about here is being and growing ourselves up, changing ourselves at the being level. That's what's significant. And when we do that, we actually become somebody else. When you change at the being level, you're no longer who you were. You're a different person than you were. That's a big difference than just thinking different thoughts. So then the question is, well, how do we go about doing that? How do we change ourselves at the being level? Well, the thing that, that we have to do, the thing that makes a being level a a being of love or a being of fear is that fear. It's not that you have to learn how to love. You have to get rid of the fear. When you get rid of the fear and the ego, you've succeeded. You will become love, you see. So it's not something you have to go out and grab and take into you. It's something you have to get rid of that's already in you. So in a way, that should make it easier. You've got all the tools you need inside. It's not that you have to go out and find better tools or find a, a better way of behaving. It's not about behaving. It's about being. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. All right, so how are we going to go about changing ourselves at the being level? How are we going to deal with that fear? 
how are we going to get rid of that ego and, and those beliefs? Because the beliefs lock us in. The beliefs keep us from being open-minded. When we have beliefs, then we get information that's contrary to our belief, we discard it. We make up a story why it's really not like that, and then we don't think about it anymore. So beliefs are just a barrier. It's a trap that limits you as far as the information you can process, the things you can think about. That's the box. You know, you live in a box and you can't get out of the box. That box is made up out of your beliefs. So we have to get rid of those beliefs so that we can see bigger pictures. We're not trapped. And we have to get rid of that ego because as long as it's about us, then it can't be about other. Love is about other. It's not about you. Love is unconditional. If it's got conditions, it's not love. It's something else. Now, the word love has so many meanings and connotations in our language that uh, you know, it's almost a minefield thinking about it. Well, what is love? Well, love is the nature of a low entropy consciousness. That's love. That's caring. That's not about yourself. So people will immediately think, well, it has to be about me. I mean, after all, I'm the one, you know, I'm the actor here, and it's me and it's other out there, all the other people, and if I don't take care of me, nobody else is going to take care of me, so I got to take care of me because that's, that's uh, part of what I have to do. I have to see things from my vision and my viewpoint. Isn't that important? Isn't it important to have ego? That's the sense of self, isn't it? And that is a confusion. Now, ego is the is awareness. You are awareness. We all are, that's what we mean when we say we're conscious, we're aware. Ego is awareness in the service of fear. That's ego. And if you think that that is a kind of a special definition that MBT you know, made up, and it's not really the ego that Freud talked about. That's not true. It's the same ego Freud talked about. It's no different. It's, when Freud talked about it, though, he talked about it as being a normal, healthy part of every individual. We all have ego. That's our sense of self. Okay? But what he didn't understand is, is that he got his, well, he did understand this. He got his data from talking to people. You know, he was, a, he was a scientist in the sense that he just didn't make up theory. He talked to lots of people. He interviewed. He analyzed. He whatever. He, he gathered information. And he found that this level of self-concern and self-interest and, and all about yourself was almost everybody was like that. And people were, seemed to be healthy. They seemed to be getting along. They were working valuable members of society and so on. So then... This ego became normal. That's what, you know, everybody that's doing things and doing well has this ego. Therefore, ego is a normal, good part. Well, what he didn't realize is that almost everybody is right up to here with fear, you know. And that, that ego he was looking at really was the result of the fear. Yes, it is normal in the sense that normal means average. No doubt about that. It's perfectly normal but it's not perfectly healthy. It's what we need to let go of. Now, awareness in the service of love is not ego. So it doesn't mean that you can't have a self-concept. It's not that a self-concept is a bad thing. It isn't. You need a self-concept. But that self-concept needs to be developed in the service of love. And that's a different thing. That's not ego. Okay. Sure, we need a sense of self because we need to know, how can I help? What can I do for you? See, there's an I in there. And we also have responsibility. I have to take care of my family. I have to pay the mortgage. You know, I have to put gas in the car. You know, there's things that I have to do. So you have to be aware of I, you have to be aware of your responsibilities, you have to be 
you know, aware of how you can be helpful, how you can be useful, what can you do for other people. So that sense of I, I am an individuated unit of consciousness, and I want to be of service. I want to do something that's useful. I want to be helpful. That's a sense of I and what you want, you see. But that's in the service of love. That's not in the I, I need this. I need, you know, I need to be appreciated. I need to be cared for. I need whatever. That's different. The fear is that you won't get your needs met. The fear is that you're not adequate or not good enough or people won't like you or all the other kind of fears that we have. A fear uh, of abandonment, a fear of failure, all these fears. Okay? That's what's driving your needs. I need this, I need that. I need more stuff. I need a new Mercedes Benz. You know? I need all kinds of things. I need status. I need importance. I need people to look up to me. I need my children to respect me. I need all these things that you need. And they all have to do with fears. I fear that I don't deserve any status. I fear that uh, my children, uh, you know, won't like me. I fear that, you know, you have all the fears that are on the other side of that. So I'm trying to give you an idea that ego is that awareness in the service of fear. It's not ego, is that awareness in the service of love. That's just you. You're at the being level. Okay, you have to, be, have to be that way. Okay, so given that what we want to get rid of is our fear, and given that our fear, if we can get rid of that, the ego then is going to go with it, right? Because if we don't have the fear, what do we have in the service of our fear? There's nothing there. So that's why when we get rid of that fear, the ego goes, and almost all the belief goes with it too. Because the reason we have those beliefs is because we, one, don't like uncertainty. Uncertainty makes us afraid. We have a fear that things might happen in ways that aren't good, that we don't want, that we don't like. And we feel powerless sometimes, and most of our beliefs have to do with sugarcoating or, or whitewashing those fears. Okay. When we think there's something really important we need to understand or we need to know, but we don't know it, well, we come up with a belief. If somebody gives us information that conflicts with the way we think, we come up with another belief. So our beliefs kind of insulate our ignorance. We have ignorance. We don't know, fill that hole with a belief. Now we feel better, because now we know. Well, I call that in the book pseudo-knowledge. We just believe we know, and it makes us feel better. So the beliefs and the, and the ego, the ego uh, being the most obvious of the two, uh, are really the problem. And what we need to do uh, is get rid of that fear. The fear is hard to find because the reason, the reason we need that ego is to get between us and the fear. It's the ego has the strategies for burying the fear where we can't see it and where we can ignore it. That's how we deal with it. We deal with that fear by pretending it isn't there or pretending that it's not scary, pretending that it doesn't bother us. And when we have strategies, to deal with that. So strategies can be all sorts of different things. <clears throat> and, they can, and they can be very varied. If we feel very insecure and inadequate, we may have a strategy to deal with that fear by being very uh, boisterous and arrogant. Because we feel inadequate, therefore we're going to be bigger than life. We're going to make ourselves noticeable and important. So we tend to be a little pushy. or we could be the wallflower. We could shrink and kind of hide because we feel inadequate. You see, that's, those are two extremes. But they're both strategies for dealing with a fear. So we have all kinds of strategies. A favorite strategy that people use in dealing with their fears is, if I don't play, 
I can't lose. So when something comes up that's stressing, something comes up where they're kind of afraid maybe it won't work out very well, an awful lot of people use that strategy. Oh, I don't care anyway. I don't really, you know, that, I'm not interested in that. And we, we decide that if we just don't play, if we don't get in that game, if we don't try, if we don't stand up and, and, uh, and say what we think, that it will somehow, then we can't lose. But the fact is that if you don't play, you can't win. You can't grow. You can't go anywhere. And if you can't move forward, what you will do is move backward. So that's a, that's a losing strategy. It's not even a hold your own strategy. That's a losing strategy. But that strategy is used for all sorts of things. That, uh, and, and you, if you think about it, you probably find that you use that strategy on a lot of things. We're not aware of our fears. They hide because we hide them with our ego. But our ego, that's really easy to see. That's there, right on the surface where we can grab hold of it and look at it. And our beliefs are also hard to see. We don't know what we believe. We have no idea because these aren't beliefs that we sat down and memorized and learned. They're beliefs that just got into us by osmosis, by convenience, by making us feel better. So they're not something we intellectually did. It just happens to us, and we take them on. Beliefs are hard, but the ego's easy. How do you find ego? Just look at your feelings. Look at your emotions. If you feel unhappy, if you feel angry, if you feel upset, if you feel anxious, all of the things that we see as negatives, if you feel irritated, that's because of ego. You can take that feeling and you can trace that feeling back to a fear. Why am I angry? Well, I'm angry because she said this and that, and that's just not fair, so I'm angry. Well, what's the fear behind that? No, you're not angry because of what she said. You choose to be angry because of what she said. Number one, take responsibility for how you feel. Nobody makes you angry. You choose to be angry. Nobody makes you upset. Nobody makes you anxious. Nobody irritates you. You choose those things in a reaction to something else, but it's your choice. You don't have to be angry. You see, you could be different. So step one, I guess, in this process of pinpointing your fear is take responsibility for your feelings. And if your feelings are negative, if your feelings aren't positive, if your life isn't a life of joy and satisfaction, then you've got fear. Because when you get rid of the fear, your life will be joy and satisfaction, primarily. That'll be your life. It'll be great. It'll be fun. And every day will just be better than the next. And you'll have a lot of joy in your life. And if that's not, your, if that's not the way you feel now, then you have fear. Well, look at those times that you feel negative. Look at the times you feel upset. Why are you upset? I am upset because I wasn't appreciated. Somebody said something that was rude to me. All right, well, what's the fear there? The fear there is, well, if I wasn't appreciated, the fear is of not being appreciated, but the deeper fear is of not being loved not being thought well of, not being thought to be important or significant, or it's that sort of stuff. In other words, it goes back to a fear of failure, a fear of inadequacy. These are fears that most of us have. So you find the, you find the negative feeling. And probably most of you don't, aren't going to stand up and say, my life is just joy and happiness and satisfaction. That's my life. You know, very few people are like that. And most of you could probably say, yeah, I've had a feeling and an emotion in the last week that probably was negative. And most of us actually could say, I've had a feeling in the last hour <laughs> that was probably negative. 
And when you're at work during the work day, you could probably say, I've had a feeling in the last two minutes that's been negative. Whenever there's any angst, oh no, that's awful. How can they do that? You, know, you see, now we try to make it all about them. They make me feel angry. You know, how could they do that to me? Why don't they see the truth that I see? That's all ego. And we act like that and feel like that all the time. Every day, almost every minute of every day. Which means we are being pushed around in our daily choices and interactions and relationships by our fear. And that's why we struggle. That's why we're not full of peace and joy and happiness and satisfaction because we're being pushed around by our fears all the time. We're making these choices, thinking these thoughts, having, choosing to be angry because we have fear, choosing to be upset because of our fear, you know, choosing frustration. So it's us that needs to change. We need to start making better choices. We need to choose to be happy. You know? So this is what MBT has to do with you. you know? So what, is, what, you know, what, is MB, what does this have to do with me? And uh, why should I care? It's because this affects all the rest of your life. It, it determines the quality of your life. It determines your relationships. See, relationships are, for most of us, where the rubber meets the road most effectively. It's in those relationships because those are the things that are up close and personal in our life. Relationships are probably where we learn and have the most opportunity to learn to grow up. It's in our connections with other people. And all sorts of relationships. You know, it's not just romantic relationships, although that's a big one. It's also relationships with your children, with your parents, with your boss, with your coworkers. It's all these relationships. That's where all those feelings that are negative comes from, right? It comes from all those relationships. That's the point. We don't go out and look at a tree and get angry. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, other, it's other people make us angry. It's those relationships. Well, that's because what we're here to do is make choices toward love. Well, that has to do with relationship. It has to do with people. It doesn't have to do with rocks and trees. It has to do with people. So it's in our relationships with people is where the rubber meets the road. And instead of approaching life in, how can I manipulate this situation to be the way I want it? How can I make this come out the way I want? How can I make those people like me? How can I get my boss to give me a promotion? How can I get what I want? How can I make my children go up to become, you know, doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs instead of, you know, drug addicts and bums, you know? How can I, how can I control the world to make it more the way I want it? See, that's all ego. Now, you do have to exercise some control in the world or you wouldn't be able to pay your mortgage. Of course, the practical side. But we go way past that. We want to control everything. Matter of fact, 95% of all our energy is put in controlling others, controlling the outside world. That's what we do. So we tend to spend our time thinking. That's why we don't live in the present moment. We live in the future. How are we going to arrange this so it comes out the way we want? How am I going to get my needs met? How am I going to make sure that people turn out the way I want them to be? My boss thinks what I want him to think. My children think the way I want them to think. How am I going to arrange all this? You see. And this, when it comes to children, yes, you do have to sometimes overrun their free will because they're children and their free will is to go out and play on the street and that's not good for them, but they don't know that. So with children, it's a little different. You do have to overrun their free will sometimes. It's not true with adults. Even very young adults, that's not true. You have to let them be. So here's a very simple uh, step to help you focus better on, on, on uh, finding your ego and, and dealing with it, is to let go of control. Stop trying to control everything. 
That means mostly get out of your head. Not, don't try to figure everything out and then make a smart move that makes things happen the way you want. You see, that's not really what you want to do. A better idea, now that's, that's okay. I'm not saying never do that. I'm saying that just shouldn't dominate your life and dominate your relationships. Sometimes you do have to make a smart move. Sometimes you do need to manipulate a situation. That's, uh, so I'm not saying that these things are never do. I'm saying don't just run your life that way unknowingly. A better way to be is things happen. And they just happen because they happen. They happen because of the way you are and the way other people are. Sometimes it's random. It just happens that way. Okay? And you get to deal with it. So you see life this way. Instead of, well, there's this world out here, and I need to control it as best I can to make it the way I know it should be, that would be best. Instead, you say, stuff happens, and I have to deal with it. I'm going to make sure that the way I deal with it is with love, is with caring, is with respect. That's the way I'm going to deal with it. So I'm going to control how I deal with it. I'm not going to try to control what happens. I'm just going to put my focus on how to deal with it. See? That's a different, it's a, just a shift in where you're looking. Instead of looking there in the future of trying to control what's going to happen, you're looking in the now of how am I going to deal with it and make that choice the best choice. So now if somebody's rude to you, you're going, how am I going to deal with that? What's the best way to deal with that rudeness? Should I get angry? You know, should I reach out and slap them for that? You know, sh scream, holler, get mad, get even? You know, what's, what's the best way to deal with that? What's the low entropy choice here? <laughs> what, you know. What's the, what's the choice that's about them, you see? And suddenly all those negative things drop out because they're obviously all bad choices. It just makes it worse. It makes everything worse when you do those negative things. The way it makes it better is when you do things because they're done out of caring. Caring for that person that made you angry. Caring for, you know, whatever there is to care for out there. Okay, so that's one thing. Stop looking at the future and how you can make it work for you, because that's all about you. And just let stuff happen. So now when somebody comes up and they're rude, you don't take it personally and say, oh, that's about me. And it's unfair because, see, it's not about you. It's about them. Their rude is about them. The way you react to that is about you. See, we tend to get that backwards. They're rude, and we immediately take it personally. It's about us, and it makes us angry because we don't deserve that. That isn't fair to us. So their rudeness suddenly becomes our problem. Well, don't take on somebody else's problem. Their rudeness is their problem, and they will need to get rid of that fear that created that rudeness themselves. That's not your job to fix them. It's not your job to explain to them why they shouldn't be rude to you. They just are the way they are. Accept that and deal with it. And how are you going to deal with it? See, it's a different perspective that we normally have in, in life. So that's one strategy. Uh, when you do that, what happens at the other end isn't that it has to happen according to your plan, you don't have a plan. You just deal with the stuff that comes, deal with it the best you can, and whatever happens, happens. And other people just have to deal with that and <laughs> deal with it the best they can, and whatever happens, happens, you see? And it just flows around, and we're all just trying to do our best to deal with things the best we can, and what happens, happens. You get to deal with what happens with them, they get to deal with what happens with you, and we're all trying to optimize our own choices. See, now that puts the focus where it needs to be. Instead of optimizing the outside world and optimizing the result, we let that stuff happen. We just want to optimize our choice. So that's one strategy for you to, to be aware of. 
And again, if you're saying, well, is that a problem of mine? Well, ask yourself, is my life full of joy, peace, and happiness? And if the answer is no, or not all the time, then you have room to improve your choices. Because when you make those choices out of love, you are full of peace and tranquility and happiness. Your life is just good that way. Okay. So, that's a strategy. Finding your, finding your negativity and following it back to your fear, that's a strategy. So how do you get rid of that fear? Let's say you say, all right, I, I get angry sometimes, or I get upset, uh, I get uh, depressed, or because things aren't the way I want them. Well, you know, of course, that's your ego. Things aren't the way you want them. You accept the way things are, and you deal with it. Okay, you don't, getting upset about it is just, it's just an ego. There's no value in it. There's nothing that getting upset about it adds to the situation. It never makes the situation better. It only makes the situation worse. See, there's absolutely no profit in that. So it's a bad choice. Why would you do things that makes your situation worse? You see, not an effective choice. Okay. So we, um, we need to deal with that fear. We've found ourselves getting angry, and we realize that it's a fear of, of um, you know, not being treated the way we want to be treated. Well, then we have to find out why do we need to be treated that way. And we work it on back, and it'll come back to some sort of fear. And it really doesn't matter so much where that fear originally came from. If you want to, you can trace that back and say, oh, yeah, I remember. The reason I'm afraid of dogs is, you know, a big dog scared me once. And now I'm afraid of dogs. Or my mother used to beat me with a fly swatter, and now I'm afraid of swipe waters or something. You can trace things back to a childhood usually and you can find roots of those fears in experiences typically. But that's really not that important. You don't have to go back and dig up those roots and say, oh, it was my mom or my dad or, you know, or the accident I had when I was 12 or that sort of thing. That may make you feel better, but mostly all that does is give you justification for it. So that you stop blaming yourself, now you can blame somebody else. Well, blame is not useful. It's another one of those negative emotions. So it really doesn't matter. We don't need to have somebody else to blame other than ourselves. We need to just stop blaming ourselves to begin with. Okay? It's not, it's not uh, helpful. It's not effective. So to deal with a fear, the only thing I can tell you to deal with a fear, the only antidote to fear, is courage. There is no other antidote to fear, just courage. You find that fear, and your first inclination will be to excuse it. To say, oh, yeah, well, that's okay. You know, that's, that's understandable. There's nothing wrong with that. But then, of course, once you dig a little deeper, you realize, well, there is something wrong with that. That's affecting the way I'm making choices now in my life in things totally unrelated. So there is something wrong with that. Now you have to have the courage to face that fear, to face it. Now what I mean by face it, I, I will say accept it. But by accepting it, I don't mean that you have to learn to like it. By accept it, I mean you have to own it. All right, I am like that. I do have that fear. I do feel inadequate. I do need to have people like me. I do need to get those strokes or I get nervous, I get upset if I don't get those, you see. So then you have to accept that, own it, and say, okay, that is the way I am. I have this fear, I have this need. People have to constantly stroke my ego, otherwise I get upset, I get nervous. Now you have to have the courage to let that go. Well, that's hard, because if you let that go, you feel certainly nobody will like you. If you don't, always smile and you're out there and you're bubbly and you're this and you're that and you're going through all this stuff that really is not you inside, but you know that this gets the reaction that you're looking for. You see, you know that if you stop that, you'll just become a, nobody even notice you exist. And that's a fear. Okay, so you have to have the courage to say, well, that's okay. If nobody notices I exist, I'll still get by. I'll deal with that. It's not going to be that big a problem. 
I have the courage. I'll just deal with it. All right, I'll be an invisible person. And what will happen is when you accept that, you've just pulled the teeth out of the fear. See, now the fear has no teeth to bite you with. The fear was that nobody will like you. You'd be invisible. Nobody will pay any attention to you because inside you're really not that worthy. You're not that worthy of all that attention. You see where now the basic fear is coming from. Inside, you're kind of inadequate. You're not all that competent, whatever. Why would anybody pay any attention to you? Well, that's, that's at the root, and you just have to accept that and say, well, okay, maybe that's right. Maybe I'm inadequate, and, no, and I don't have anything to offer. Well, that's okay. I'm going to be authentic. I'm just going to be me. However that is, that takes courage, because now you're going to have to go out into the world and be authentic which is where we're going. Be an authentic person. Be who you are. That's what you become when you get rid of the fear. You're not this fear going out interacting because of the fear. You are just you. And when you accept that, the fear no longer can bite because you've accepted it. You've owned it. Now what can it do to you? Okay, so now you're in a scary place. You go out and live your life that way. What you'll find out is that that fear was nothing but smoke. It wasn't real. It wasn't real at all. Just smoke, and it just blows away. And then you're done with that fear. And now you feel like 100 pounds just got taken off your shoulders. You don't have to do all that stuff to get attention and be the one and have the, have the cool joke and, you know, be uh, this and that and dress really well and, you know, all the things that you felt like you needed to do, otherwise nobody would notice you existed. You don't need all that, you see. And that's a big load off because now you can just be you. And that's so much more fun. And so much happier. So that's how you deal with the fears, is, is with courage. Now that's easy to say, but it's hard to do. Because when you get there, and that fear is telling you, run, hide. You can't be authentic. That, doesn't, that won't get you anywhere. That'll get you fired, not promoted. You have to have the courage to go do it anyway. It takes real courage. So pick a little fear to start with. Don't pick your big fear. Pick a little fear, a little something that, that just uh, gets you upset, aggravates you, and work on that one, because that won't be so hard. It's your first fear is the hardest one. Once you get rid of a significant fear, even if it's small, you'll feel the difference. It is day and night, and you'll feel so much better because that's gone. And now when people say things like that, instead of upsetting you, there's just no negative reaction at all. If anything, you think, hey, I wonder why they feel that way. Maybe they don't understand, or maybe I've, I've uh, you know, given them the wrong feeling about what's going on. I should, next, you know, sometime when the situation's changed, I'll, I'll see if I can't, you know, uh, do things that'll make that better. See, now you're thinking about, how can you make that better for them? Instead of, oh no, look what they did to me. So you've changed it around. And you can make it better, because most of these arguments and things have to do with misinformation. People have different viewpoints and different perspectives than you do, and if you see their perspective, well, sometimes their position becomes more understandable. Even if it's wrong, it becomes more understandable, you see. And now you're not quite so upset about it. And maybe you can even uh, help out. So if you're getting my point, this is how you need to change your approach to life. Stop trying to control it. Stop trying to make an outcome. Don't be so goal-oriented, particularly in your relationships. You can be goal-oriented in paying your mortgage, goal-oriented in putting gas in the car, but not so goal-oriented in your dealings with people. Let the people just be who they are and deal with it. Okay, so that's some of what does it have to do with me. Um, also, you should know that as you grow up, not only does your life get a lot better, but all the people you're in relationship with, their lives get a lot better too. 
And when the relationships get better, the connections between people get better. You help them change their perspective. Because now when they say something rude to you, and you just smile at them, or you just, well, smile at them may be the wrong thing. If you, if you just don't get angry with that, and then later you try to see what the problem was and fix it or help it or something, you see, you help them let go of that. And pretty soon you'll have them noticing, why was I so rude? You see? Because they're not getting the reaction. It's a game you play. I see something rude, you get upset. Okay, so then you say something rude back to me. And then I say something rude back to you. And now we can have this little fight, and that kind of gives us meaning in life, right? <laughs> the meaning isn't very nice, but you know, that's how most people gain meaning in their life. It's, it's these tussles and relationships. It's all this, this stuff going on. And, you know, I don't let you run over me, you know, and you don't let me run over you. And we got, both got this don't tread on me attitude because it's all self-focused. And uh, once you cut that cycle out, the other people are rude and they don't get that back. Pretty soon they're thinking, I'm pretty rude, aren't I? <laughs> Maybe I need to change. Maybe I need to grow up because that person's actually a very nice person. And I understand now more their position because they came and talked to me. So uh, I need to clean up my own act, you see. So you affect other people. All the people in your world start to grow up some because you grow up. So you see there's power in changing yourself. It's not just you. It's like, well, how am I going to save the world by changing me? I'm just one person. But you will change a hundred other people that you interact with. Even if you don't act, interact with them much. You're going through a grocery store line and you're paying your bill. And if you are a person who's full of love and caring, the person that's just sitting there ringing up your bill will feel better. It'll make their day better just to check you out of their line. And if they were a little grouchy by the time you leave, and all you did was stand there, maybe chat with them a sentence or two, by the time you leave, they feel better. You see? And you do that all over the place, everybody that you meet. This works that way because of the way we interact. So that's how you save the world, is by getting rid of your fear. It's, it's, it's your job to fix yourself, nobody else's. And it's not your job to fix anybody else. So let's see. That may have created a whole lot of questions. Um, you know, you. Um, we do have this, this ability, which is a really a, a neat ability, to modify future probability. In this virtual reality, there is the past databases and there's the future probable database. And that probable future can be changed somewhat, nudged by our intents. So we can affect what happens next just by our thoughts. That's how the placebo effect works. You get better just because you think you're going to get better. You have a positive attitude toward getting better. With that positive attitude toward getting better, you actually do get better just because you're putting intent into a recovery rather than intent into, oh no, this is so awful, I've got, you know, my liver hurts or something. You put that negative energy into it, it retards your recovery. It makes it worse. You have that positive attitude, oh, I'm going to get better now. I'm starting to feel better already, you see. I'm going to go out and do something. Now you start to heal. You get better with that. It's because it's positive. So we can modify future probability with our intents. That's how we heal with our minds. We can heal ourselves. We can heal other persons just with our intent. So you need to be careful about your intent. You see, when you're negative and you're feeling miserable and you're upset with people, your intent is negative and miserable. And you help create a negative, miserable reality for yourself. So you see, once you get rid of that fear, you're starting to create a positive, joyful reality for yourself. And a funny thing happens is that once you get rid of that fear, it's almost like you have perfect control. You let go of control altogether. 
you just you'll just happily deal with whatever comes in this end. You'll deal with it the best way you can, and whatever happens out there, well, that's the way it is. When you get to that level, you find that the stuff that comes in this end is all really nice. It's wonderful, and as you have things to learn and, and things that you need to figure out or learn or do, they just unravel right in front of you. You know, I really need to learn this. I really need to go there. I need to do these other things. I need to find out of the stuff. And 10 minutes after you say that, somebody walks up and gives you all the information you just ask for. You see, life turns into one of those mysterious series of synchronicities that things drop at your feet just as you need them. You interact with things. You don't have to control anything anymore because everything that comes to you is good. It's wonderful. It's educational. And even the stuff that comes in that's maybe a little ugly or hurts a little, you see the lesson in it. You don't see the pain in it. Because pain, eh, I'll deal with it. So it's not a big deal. You don't wince when you see a little pain coming. You just deal with it the best you can when it's a hard thing. You see the lesson in it. The challenge in it is to deal with it with caring and with love, not with fear. So now it becomes like a game. Now it's like playing World of Warcraft. You get these missions and these challenges and, and quests that you go on, you see, and the quest is to take whatever comes and deal with it well. That's your quest. So now it becomes fun. It's a game. Okay, that was not what I planned. I'm stranded now in the middle of the desert, you know, between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. My car doesn't work anymore. Not exactly the way I planned my day, but this is an adventure. We'll see how this works out. You see? All right, what are we going to do next? And you go through it like that instead of starting to cry and, you know, worry about all the awful things that could happen, which then that intent tends to bring those awful things closer to happening. You see? You have this positive intent, and you'll find that you'll get out of your, your broken down car, you'll walk out. And within two minutes, somebody will pull up and say, do you need a ride? Is there a problem here? You want me to take you to a, you know, a gas station, get some gas, and come back and get your car? And you get all this wonderful help because you have a positive attitude and you bring positive things into your world. It's like uh, Dagda said the other night. She said she changed her attitude and suddenly people started to be nicer to her. <laughs> you say, well, how does that work? Yeah, that's why that works that way. You change your attitude and people suddenly get nicer to you. Well, we could go on and on like this for a long time. Where are we on time, by the way? The, the keepers of the time, are they, uh, huh? Yeah. Oh, the keepers of the time all snuck out, huh? Yeah, yeah we just go on forever, huh? no breaks, nothing, no food. All right, let's take a break here. See, we can govern ourselves. We don't need we don't need timekeepers.